Uh, hello, everybody. And my name is Davide. I'm a production engineer at Facebook. And I'll be talking for a bit about what we've been doing with SystemD for the past year or so. Uh, I've given versions of this talk before. And hopefully, every year, there's something new that's interesting. Uh, I'll start with a quick recap of the story so far. I'll talk for a bit about what we're doing for deployment and how that ties into the development workflow we use for SystemD. I'll quickly go through a few new features. And I'll try to close with some case studies if there's time. So without further ado, um, as I said, I'm a production engineer. I work on the operating systems team. Uh, my team is responsible for maintaining CentOS on the Facebook fleet. We have a lot of machines, as you might imagine. Uh, we have a lot of physical machines. All of these machines run CentOS. All of these machines run SystemD. Uh, we run CentOS 7 on the fleet. Uh, we're starting to prep for Cent 8. Uh, but right now, everything is on Cent 7. And by now, we've been doing this for a while. We've been running SystemD for at least three years on a wide scale. And it's, it's set to the point where it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's been quite interesting seeing internally where, how things moved and how people reacted to it. When we started doing this, people were fairly skittish. We had to do a lot of work explaining people why we were making the effort to move to SystemD when we we're doing CentOS 7. And now it's at the point where it's the opposite. We have people reaching out to our team and to other teams fairly frequently with ideas they have for new features they want to build that might tie into SystemD or how they might leverage new SystemD features for what they're doing. Uh, and at the same time, we've also started doing a lot of development ourselves around SystemD and its ecosystem, contributing both to SystemD proper and to tools around it. And I'll go over some of these. So how do we get SystemD on the fleet? We deploy SystemD with Chef uh, from RPMs. We don't run the SystemD that's in CentOS. We build it from GitHub uh, because we want to be able to track what, what Upstream is doing. So at the end of last year, we were on 239. Uh, when 240 was released, 240 was a pretty big release. Uh, it took us quite, a, a, quite some time to qualify it, so we ended up skipping it for deployment. We went from 239 to 241, and then 242, which is what's running now as of today on 98-ish percent of the fleet. Uh, we started playing with 243. Uh, it's, mm, it's not in wide deployment yet, but we have it running in some places. Uh, that's probably what I'm going to start working on when I get back from this conference. Uh, the backport we use is based on the Fedora packaging. For, is, you can find it there if you're interested. Uh, in general, this process works pretty well. We've been doing this for a while. We don't have any major, major issues with it itself. The main pain point here is that the long tail is annoying. And the long tail is pretty small. It's 2% of machines. But when you have a lot of machines, 2% is still quite a bit. And there are two main reasons for the long tail. One reason is that sometimes you just have broken machines, and broken machines Sometimes don't run chef. Sometimes their RPM database is corrupt. Sometimes things happen and systemd doesn't get updated. And for one reason or another, they stick in production, and it takes a while for them to go away. I don't care about those that much, because eventually they'll go away, and they're broken. So who cares? Uh, the thing that's more annoying is that sometimes when we do a release, we have to put in place exceptions, because we will find either we will find a change in upstream or a bug or something that affects a specific customer in a way that they can't quite update right now, and at the same time, we don't want to stop the whole rollout just for them. So we'll pin them to the previous version, and then we'll go on. Or sometimes we'll find that something changed, and something our customer was doing was either wrong or not, or doesn't fit quite well with the model. Uh, so you end up tracking these around. We have four or five of these in place right now. Uh, I think the oldest goes back to still to 239. Um, we, we are fairly diligent at cleaning this up, but sometimes you have to deal with that. Uh, now, as I said, the release process works fairly well, but it does take a while. Uh, oftentimes, uh, from the moment when system the upstream cuts are released to when we deploy it in production, uh, the actual manual work of prepping the RPMs for testing is a couple of days of work, maybe. Uh, but it can take quite a while from getting it to the point where it's, we feel safe rolling it on the fleet. Uh, part of the reason here is because when, um, when we go from one release to another, we don't generally do much testing with what's happening in between. We will follow what's going on upstream, but we do deployments on the fleet between major releases. So there can be quite a lot of changes that accumulate, and that can lead to late last time, last minute surprises for people. Uh, the other thing is that there's basically two people doing this, which is me and Anita. Uh, so if one of us ends up under a bus, that's not ideal. Uh, what we'd really like to be able to do is do uh, development and testing concurrently. Uh, most of the time when people do feature development on systemd, they'll do it on master. Then they'll end up exporting the patch internally and testing it on whatever release we have deployed. This isn't too bad, but it is friction. Uh, we would also like to be able to do more and faster integration testing, having better ways to 
find issues early on and have a fast figure process, both for our developers and for upstream developers. So I started looking at what we could do there, and we ended up building a little CI-CD pipeline for this. This is not open source, uh, mostly because it ties into internal stuff. It's also not particularly rocket science. We take the Fedora packaging. I have a horrifying shell script that replaces the tarball in there with a tarball made from Gitmaster. It runs every day at 10 a.m. It builds the RPM. It runs the test suite as part of the build. If that passes, it deploys the RPM on a small number of machines. And we have a daily running on a small number of machines. Uh, we are working right now on getting this hooked up also with the container testing infrastructure, because one of the main customers we have of SystemD is the container infra. So this way, we can find issues early on. Now, this is something pretty simple, and yet this let us already find a significant number of issues way before our release. And when we cut 2.43, when we cut 2.42 and later 2.43, this was a lot faster. Uh, we had this running since March. Uh, it led to filing maybe about 10 GitHub issues between GitHub issues and PRs for various things we found throughout it. Uh, one thing I want to add soon is te integration testing of bare metal as well. Uh, I also, I've also started looking, there's a test suite on GitHub that Red Hat uses for doing the um, CI based on CentOS hooked to the upstream repo. Uh, I want to start looking to see if we can run those tests internally as well to have better coverage there. Uh, so that's on the deployment side. On the development side, as I said, we would like to be able to do faster, faster iteration and faster development. And we would also like to be able to leverage the internal tooling we have for doing code review, for doing CI. Right now, the way people do code review for system D changes tends to be they make a paste bin equivalent of what their patch is, and one of us looks at it, which is not ideal. Uh, we also already know how to do this, because if you look at it, this is kind of like the kernel development process. Uh, so the current plan is to basically do what the kernel team does. So we are putting together an internal system D repo that will be just a read-only mirror of what's on GitHub uh, with the same branches, same tags. People will branch off master for feature branches. So if they're working on a thing, they'll branch off master, work on there, make their PR. Hopefully, they'll build a thing, cut from it, and test it before they make a PR. But you know, this way, at least they can get signal on what's going on. When we make releases, we'll branch releases off release a pre release tags, cherry pick from the feature branches, cut the release. This has also the benefit that we can get rid of the hairy pile of patches we use right now with the RPM packaging, and we'll just have a simple script to grab patches uh, from, from the Git tree. This is exactly what the kernel team does. Uh, we think it might work and make life easier for us and hopefully lead to having better, better and faster feedback outside as well, but we'll see. And I'd be actually be interested to hear if uh, other folks here do internal development for System D, what develop process you use, or if you build tooling around this. Uh, now, let's go over quickly a few new features that landed recently. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, because there's been a lot of other talks from Facebook people on things, and I'd rather have them talk about what they work on. Uh, one thing that hasn't come up yet uh, that is pretty cool and ended up in 243 is exact condition. Exact condition is something that Anita uh, developed. It's kind of a hybrid between condition and exact start pre, uh, where it ran a command before the unit is started, actually before the pre-scripts run. And depending on the exit code of the command, it can pass, so it will keep running the unit. It can fail, mark the unit as failed, or it can skip execution, kind of when a condition fails. Uh, now, why would you want to do this? Uh, well, I can tell you why we want to do this. Uh, the reason we want to do this is that we want to gently nudge people to do continuous deployment of their tools. Uh, so we want to have a, binary, a tool that checks the binary, and if the binary is too old, just refuse to start the service. Um, and then do a bunch of other things, but that's, that's one of the main reasons. And this is, a fairly, this is a fairly simple and straightforward way to do it. Uh, there's a possible improvement where we could maybe have a percent specifier so we don't have to copy the name of the binary there, but that's, that's just sugar. Um, this is a, actually a pretty good example of, I think, feature development that goes well, because we came up with the idea of maybe we should do something like this before Christmas internally. We discussed it. We played with a few ideas. We were in Brno in uh, February for DevConf. We met with the system the developers. We discussed this with them. We brainstormed on possible designs. And we ended up with, oh, yeah, doing like this seems to be simple enough and it could work. And then it was coded in the months afterwards, and it landed in 243. I think this is pretty much the ideal way you want development to go. Um, on the resource management front, the, there's already been several talks. Uh, Teju and Dan's talk covered resource control in general. Daniel and Anita talked about UMD. 
Johannes is going to talk later today about SumPy. Uh, two things I want to raise. Um, there's disable controllers that landed for transient units as well. Uh, disable controllers is quite handy because it allows you to turn off specific controllers without having to rely on kernel command line flags, so without having to reboot the box. Uh, the other thing that landed is uh, a number of OOM, uh, OOM specific control for the kernel OOM, not the user space OOM around C group 2, notably OOM policy, so you can apply OOM settings to specific C groups. Um, something else we've been working on for a while is PySteamD. Uh, Alvaro did a lightning talk on this yesterday. Uh, so PySteamD is available there. It's a thin size on wrapper on top of SDBus. It wraps the SDBus API with the idea of making it easier to interact with SystemD, but it also allows you to pocket DBus in general. Uh, right now, this supports pretty much all the DBus properties exposed by SystemD. Uh, it's been working quite well. We've been very happy with it, and we've started building quite a lot of tooling around it internally. Uh, I would like to see, to see this more used in general, because at least in my experience, it's one of the most stable ways to interact to DBus from Python. Uh, once in the landing recently, is also soccer support, so you can do fairly neat or terrifying things, depending on your point of view, uh, where when you, that's just an example you can import to try, but what that does under the hood is that it makes a transient socket, makes a transient service, then forks off and a little Python web server and it ends up being managed as a proper service with a proper socket, which is nice. Um, I mentioned before, we use Chef for config management. Uh, we have a code book called FP Systemd uh, for managing Systemd, some GitHub. Uh, it's been there for a while. Uh, we, there was quite a bit of work on this in the last half or so, mostly internals. One thing that's interesting is uh, when you write on disk uh, Systemd units, you generally end up doing that using templates. Uh, do using templates for the managing overrides is what we were doing before. It's really annoying because you end up writing the same boilerplate code, which is make the directory, make the template, then delete the directory, clean up the template, reload systemd. It's obnoxious. So I, w I wrote a little um, customer resource in Chef that lets you drop an override, and internally it figures out where should it go. It cleans it up when it needs to be cleaned up. It deletes reload systemd when it needs to be reloaded. Uh, this is pretty useful, and it's straightforward enough, and the syntax is about the same as the upstream's uh, systemd unit um, resource in Chef. Uh, then, one more thing uh, that uh, Chris Down has been working on lately is a linter for systemd units. Uh, when people use systemd, they find about a lot of features that systemd has, and they start using them. Some of these features are great. Some of these features, we'd really rather them not use them. Um, like one example is people using kill mode equal process and not really understanding what it does, um, or people using interesting settings for namespacing without really understanding them. Uh, so all of these are things that are well suited for linting. There's already a bare bones, it's not really a linter, it's more of a consistency checker built into systemd-analyze. Uh, this is meant more of a general purpose linting tool where you can define a policy for the things you care about and then it can surface them. Uh, we have this running internally. It exists and it works. Uh, we would like to open source it by the end of the year. It's a standalone tool, so there's nothing Facebook specific in it. Uh, hopefully, people will find it useful, uh, and maybe it will help other companies and folks prevent issues there. Uh, okay, I have a couple of horror stories uh, on the same theme of implicit dependencies. Uh, so, on this one, we had a bunch of machines where after we rolled out a new system version. I don't remember if it was 241 or 242. We started seeing that NTP was now starting on boot. Uh, after considerable digging, we discovered that uh, the NTP service in, uh, in CentOS uses private temp, uh, which is fine, uh, except private temp internally takes a dependency, an implicit dependency on temp.mount, which I did not know and only found out after digging through this. Uh, this would be great, except on these machines, for because of the way they were set up, people didn't really notice that the way they were set up was that they would boot, uh, temp mount would start and do its thing, but then we would mask temp mount in chef. So you would end up with this unit that would be both active and masked, which is probably not something that's supposed to work. And in fact, while this works in 239, in the sense that by works I mean it doesn't complain, uh, from on later versions, systemd will hard fail and refuse to start a unit that happens to have a dependency on a thing that is both active and masked. Uh, so yeah, this was not great. Uh, this was actually one of the, reason, the things I mentioned before where we had to pin, pin this fleet to 239 for a while while we figured this out. Uh, it took us probably a week 
working on it on and off because it wasn't really a showstopper. Uh, we we could keep it running just fine when it was back on two thirty nine. Uh, so yeah, uh, implicit dependencies are kind of annoying. We had another case like that where we had a, we had some hosts where some directories just were on their own boot. After digging, we found that the temp files not, was not being cr created because systemd temp files setup never ran. And systemd temp files setup depends on local FS, which depends on swap. Uh, except one of my colleagues was working on this cookbook called FPSwap uh, to do encrypted swap and a bunch of other things. And he added a whole bunch of masked unit as dependencies of swap.target, uh, which makes the whole thing fail. So the entire thing gets pruned. It doesn't exist anymore. And you end up with no temp files. Uh, the way we debug this, by the way, both of these problems, but this one specifically, was you, if you use system the analyze, system the analyze has two really handy commands, uh, plot and dot. Um, one will give you a butcher style plot of the boot, the other will give you the octopus style dependency graph. Uh, the dependency graph is completely useless in our case because it ends up being this gigantic thing, but you can tell it to only show you a subset of it, which is very helpful. You can also enable debug logging in PID1 either by killing it with a special signal or by passing a command line flag. This is actually how we found this out, because we ended up seeing the debug message that said, this tree is getting prone because this thing doesn't exist anymore. And that's all I have. Questions? Hi. Um, you mentioned that you uh, are starting to think of debugging system D like debugging the kernel. Um, uh, developing. Developing yep. the kernel, but also, um, I guess developing involves debugging. Can you, can you take, elaborate a little bit more on that analogy between kernel level stuff? And, yep. I mean, are you bisecting things? Are you the whole, the whole range of what yep. that would mean? So I meant that primarily in terms of development workflow. Um, more than, than specifically on the debugging side. In terms of development, we have a very well-honed process where we have an internal kernel tree. We, we use the, exactly that, the feature, the feature branches and the release branches model. Uh, we have automated testing for the kernel. We have CI. We have automated deployments. We have very good way to understanding, either via CI or via A-B testing, whether a specific change is going to impact things and how it's going to impact them. And we would like to bring that to systemd as well and eventually to other system software we work on. Uh, for debugging specific issues, uh, I, I mean, it ends up becoming, it's very different, actually, I think, than developing the kernel in some senses, and it tends to be very hit or miss. What I personally do is play with the, play with the debug logging, play with tools available on the box. Surprisingly, oftentimes, tracing PID1 ends up being very useful for understanding what's going on. Uh, we had a couple of cases where ended up with PID1 uh, deadlocked or in bad states. I talked about them last year, actually. Um, and in those cases, tracing was how we found out what the hell was going on there. Uh, we had interesting and tricky interactions between kernel and user space sometimes, especially when there's API mismatches or things that change. Uh, but that doesn't, I, wouldn't, I say that doesn't really happen that often nowadays. We got pretty good at that. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, uh, I would assume that at Facebook you are logging a lot of a lot of stuff. Uh, do you use journal D or do you have a different logger logging system? Uh, yep. are, you, are you logging remotely or locally? Uh, we run journal D on every machine in the fleet. We run journal, by default we run journal D with a 10 megabyte uh, volatile journal, uh, and then we run our syslog on all the machines, and our syslog ships the logs off uh, somewhere. I I don't know what happens afterwards, actually. Um, uh, there, there is a lot collection infrastructure managed by the security team for that. Uh, the reason we do this is because people really like being able to grab valid messages and stuff like that. And there's some amount of tooling that also does automation sometimes based on that. We've been trying to move people towards the journal because usually what happens is that I give up training internally on this and people realize the journal is nice and they would really like to use it, and they find out all the journal CTL commands they could use, and then they ask me if they can deploy it. It's, it's kind of difficult to have both the journal and Narcissus log running concurrently because you end up double writing and causing a lot of extra I.O., and we have applications that can be extremely chatty in terms of logging, so if you end up writing three gigabytes a second of logs, that's, that's not great. 
Um, one thing that will help, uh, we, we've been looking at ways, right now the journal is a bit all or nothing endeavor, because either it's entirely volatile or it's entirely on disk. We've been looking at ways that we could have a per unit setting here, and that would help transition things over, because in a lot of cases it would be one application team that would really like to use the journal, but maybe everybody else not quite yet. Um, I think this is one of the things that I might play with when we start rolling out the next CentOS release and see if we can couple with that rollout, maybe nudging people to use this more. Uh, have you looked into like using our syslog and G because it has modules to slurp up the journal D and as well as syslog entries and other things together such that those who want grabbing our syslog they can and those who use journal they can and you're writing once and storing once. Uh, well, you can do that, but but you still you you still end up writing twice though, don't you? No. Sure, but then when you run journal CTL, you only get the, the small buffer you have. Because, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the problem there, yeah. Uh, we, we actually have our syslog set up that way right now. I think it uses the, the module to get the I, IMK journal or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of the problem, because if you, if you only have a small volatile buffer, then if you actually want to use journal CTL or if you do system CTL status on something, you see no more logs. And, and that's, that's a bit annoying. Uh, regarding the linter mm -hmm. uh, tool, I was wondering, since you mentioned it's more than just linting, uh, maybe analyzing too, why not integrate it into system D analyze? And might then, uh, if not, you know, why not? And then also then with the versions of system D changing and the unifile being different, how do you manage that? So uh, some of the things that we wanted to do in the linter actually ended up in Analyze. Uh, one thing specifically was uh, parsing time specs and validating that time specs, like when you do on calendar or something, were correct. Uh, that ended up being implemented as a feature in Analyze itself. I think implementing the whole linter as part of Analyze is something that would probably be possible. I think it would maybe be kind of out of scope for Analyze itself, uh, especially because we wanted specifically this to be pluggable in terms of policy, and have maybe the ability to have more complex policies. I don't know how well that will fit there. Chris is actually there, and he can answer that more usefully than I can, most likely. Uh, thank you. Um, so another reason is because um, if you look inside uh, the systemd source, like one of the things we have is uh, kind of we have a lot of little bits of unit state. We have a lot of little bits of like, go look for this thing and store it somewhere. We don't really have a way to kind of homologate that back to, here is how the unit file looks, or here is how, you know, you can get something in system CTL show, but it, it's hard to map that back to like, here is how we got to that outcome. And that's often the thing we need to know is like, how do we get here? Um, so it, currently it's hard to just make it part of system CTL analyze because uh, I mean, you would, you can do it, but you would again have to kind of re-implement a unit parser and do all kinds of other stuff, and I think it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> thing is, thank you, Daniel, for your talk. Thank you. uh, we got a quick five-minute break. Sorry.